Arming Air Crews, page 114 of The Gun Rights War by Neil Knox. This is dated February 12th, 1988, and there's a foreword by the editor, his son, Chris. News item, December 7th, 1987, Los Angeles Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 1771, a daily nonstop between Los Angeles and San Francisco, crashes. Investigators find a 44 Magnum pistol in the wreckage, along with a threatening note written on an airsick bag. From flight data recorder analysis, the investigators determined that a disgruntled airline employee had shot the pilot and co-pilot, then shot himself before the airplane crashed. 44 people died. The following is an unpublished discussion paper, which Neil Knox circulated on Capitol Hill. Again, dated February 12th, 1988. Problem, no matter how rigid security may be, it will always be possible to smuggle a lethal weapon aboard an airliner, as demonstrated by the PSA suicide murders in which a 44 Magnum with an eight and three quarter inch barrel was smuggled aboard because in FAA regulations, the pilot was helpless against an armed murderer invading the cockpit. Proposed solution, again, allow airline captains to be armed as a last ditch protection against a crazed murderer or a calculating terrorist, and let the fact that they are armed be known. Factual background, prior to about 1967, passengers were allowed to transport unloaded firearms in the cabin New regulations were issued, allowing passengers' guns to be transported only in the cockpit under control of the captain. In 1971, coinciding with the Sky Marshals program where armed marshals flew as guards on random flights, a law was adopted banning all weapons within the captain and cockpit, theoretically making the aircraft sterile. As, an evident, as evidenced by reported instances, particularly the PSA disaster, that sterility cannot be guaranteed. The Sky Marshall program was found to be costly and ineffective and was discontinued, but crews remained disarmed. However, individual captains have frequently carried personal arms in their approach chart bags as a practice eliminated by the recent requirement that air crews go through the security with passengers. Argument, if a captain can be entrusted with a $30 million aircraft and 300 passengers, he can be trusted with a firearm. A shot fired through an aircraft skin will not destroy its pressurization and almost certainly would not damage any critical component. While it could hit a passenger, loading the gun with short range shot loads would diminish that possibility and make aircraft damage even less likely. But the loss of a single innocent life is, par prefer is, innocent life is far preferable to the loss of hundreds. Arming and training captains and crews would eliminate the present situation where airliners are sitting ducks. Another editor's note at the end. This paper never went anywhere, being too radical. As of the writing, years after September 11, 2001 attacks, a program to allow pilots to again be armed is mired in red tape to the point of uselessness. The preferred solution to avoid a repeat of September 11 attacks is to scramble jets to shoot down hijacked airplanes with their passengers and crews. One argument against ar arming the pilots is that they may be distracted from his responsibilities of flying the plane in the presence of a 38 in their bag. Given that thinking, one has to wonder what sort of distractions would be faced by an air guard pilot armed to the teeth as he flies in a single seat jet in a single seat fighter. It's particularly curious if the part time warrior's full time job is like so many air guardsmen, an airline pilot. The irony would be hilarious if it was not so deadly serious. The next section is called Squeaky Gets Personal starts on page 116 and is dated January 30th, 1988. When Lynette Squeaky Fromm escaped from a West Virginia prison during Christmas week, it brought back an old, unpleasant memories. 
It also reopened a question that can now be discussed. Fromm was one of the drug-fried followers of Charles Manson, who is still serving time for the helter-skelter mass murders of actress Sharon Tate and her guests. Like so much else she has done over the years, her trail break made no sense, for it added five years to her sentence, which she was just about to be paroled. In 1975, half a dozen years after the Tate and LaBianca murders, Squeaky again broke into headlines when she attempted to assassinate President Gerald Ford using a 45 auto that didn't have a round in the chamber, which raised the questions of where she got the gun, who put her up to it, and did she really intend to kill the president, or was she making a political statement? Whether the intent, her actions, coming within two weeks of another Ford assassination attempt in which another dingling woman shot a fired a shot, triggered a robust push for an additional gun control laws. As usual, I was much involved in the leg legislative battle, but there was also a personal involvement that I've never before discussed for reasons that will become obvious. Shortly after Fromm's assassination attempt, the press reported that she and another Manson girl, Sandra Good, had a lengthy list of prominent people in their San Francisco apartment. The sensationalist press called it a death list. Not long after that story broke, an FBI man came to my hand loader and rifle office. I was then the editor and publisher. Asked that I close the door and told me that I was under court order not to reveal what he was about to tell me. He said that the Manson girls list was actually a large number of empty envelopes addressed primarily to corporate executives and other prominent people. The FBI told me that my name was on two of those envelopes, but they didn't know what the list was for or what it meant. One envelope was addressed to me at Rifle Magazine, which even if it had been intended to contain a death threat was no big deal since I started preaching against gun control. I've received dozens of letters saying things like, if you don't quit promoting violence, I'm going to kill you. However, the FBI got my undivided attention when he said the second envelope was addressed to Mr. and Mrs. Neil Knox at my home address in Prescott, Arizona, which I made certain was never published anywhere. A regular reader of the magazines when I was married for my wife, Jay, did well on the bench at, at the bench rest circuit, but her name never appeared on the masthead. Before leaving, the agent again warned me that I was, wasn't to write or say anything, but he needn't have bothered. There was enough dopers in Prescott and a nearby progressive college that I wasn't about to broadcast the possibility that I was on Squeaky Fromm's supposed death list. Some of the kooks might have wanted to do Squeaky a favor, particularly some local who may have supplied her with my home address. I called a family conference to warn my teenage children as an extra precaution, extra precaution, kept a piece of artillery loaded within a reach for several months. There was no provision under Arizona law for a license to carry a concealed firearm, but under the state constitution, a gun may be carried openly, which is a little awkward when going to church. Prescott had an ordinance prohibiting carrying a loaded gun, but it was one of those times when I was more concerned about what the lawless would do if I didn't than the, what the law would do if I did. The envelopes, particularly the one addressed to me at the magazine, may have been meaningless, and a year or so later it occurred to me that they may have even been related to a hand-addressed, handwritten letter that I received from San Francisco a few months before the assassination attempts on Ford. That letter was supposedly from a hunter who had been shot at by unforeseen members of a society of anti-hunters who yelled at him to get out of the woods or you and all your bloodthirsty hunters will be killed. It was obviously from an anti-hunter who thought he or she would scare us off with the letter to the editor, the kind of nutty notion that a squeaky from might dream up. But I wrote a letter asking for details. Not surprising, my letter came back marked no such address. The envelopes addressed to me, as well as the Ford assassination attempt itself, may have been related to another harebrained scheme to make a social statement. During Fromm's trial, I called the U.S. attorney who was 
uh, prosecuting the case, for nothing had been revealed about the reason for those envelopes, and I wanted to know if my family and I were under any real threat. The prosecutor told me that he had no idea why my name was included, and then, almost as an afterthought, asked if I had written anything or been nationally involved in the gun control debate. When I told him yes, he said, oh, that's it then. The girls support gun control. What better way to promote a gun law than to assassinate a president or even to pretend an assassination attempt with an unloaded gun? Crazy? Sure. You think Squeaky Fromm isn't? Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The guys and gals at gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thank you for watching gunwebsites.com. Do 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 do.